Uh, I think one of them was like watching this film as like getting stabbed in the head. Uh, <laughs> Succinct. <laughs> Succinct. What's another one? So so independent. It's cinem- It's cinematic masturbation. There you go. Um, mm-hmm. There's been some good ones. I mean, that's one of the things about the whole thing is like the passion that Room fans have is so impressive. Uh, they just come up with ways to keep reinventing the room in a way that's fresh and fun. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you too because the book ends right after the premiere. Uh, how did Tommy react to that initial response to the movie? Like, because it probably differed from what he had in mind or what he expected. Uh, but when you're hearing yeah, peals I mean, of laughter, you know. I mean, I think um, that's the scary thing about making a film in general is you, you think a scene means something and an audience watches it and it, it, it filters through them in a totally different way. So mm-hmm. especially here with it, the room supposed to be, it's supposed to be the street crime desire, <laughs> And you're getting laughs all the way through. I think it was probably uh, alarming and a little confusing. And so I think Tommy took a little while to process that right. and ultimately accepted it and figured, hey, if, if that's what moviegoers want to see this film as, then why not? I'll show up and let's, uh, you know, as, as he says before every screen, you can laugh, you can cry, you can express yourself, but please don't hurt each other. <laughs> kind of saying whatever you guys want this film to be, uh, you know, like show that. up and enjoy it. He's embraced it. Yeah. So then, um, yeah. Well, so then how how long was it before uh, you guys realized that you had the midnight movie phenomenon of it? Because the movie also kind of just rushes through, like how big it is at the end. Um, like, how did that come about? Because from what I remember hearing, I can't remember if this is the actual story or what, but. Um, I heard that there was like some that the movie had bombed. That he rented the theater at Sunset Five, and it bombed opening weekend because it was just a total <laughs> unknown thing. And then some random guy that um, and I'm saying this if anybody feels awkward, I say it, I'm just putting it this way. Only way I really know how to describe it that some gay guy went who had a lot of influential influence over the West Hollywood scene who, who loved campy movies and was like, oh my god, on like Tuesday afternoon. And like told a bunch of friends, you got to see this. So like fifty guys came with him that night, and then it just turned into a monster Wednesday and Thursday, and the theater kept it going. And then after two or three weeks, they said, "Hey, we can't just keep this here forever." So they came up with the idea of midnight movies as an option, and it exploded from there. Is, is that accurate or not? Uh, it was a college student named Michael Russole. He was uh, a film student. Oh, he uh, okay. discovered it and had brought in a bunch of his friends um, and kind of came up with the whole spoon thing. And it just goes to show like, all you got to do is affect one person with your film and look what, look what can happen from there. But it was a slow burn. I mean, it was, you know, it came out in 2003, uh, you know, and then by 2004 college kids started seeing it and that kind of grew a little bit, but it didn't really start to, uh, become nationwide until like 2009, 2010. There was an article written in Entertainment Weekly that came out in 2000, the end of 2008. So it took, um, it took, you know, it took several years, but it was built up through the people, which is really uh, the, the best way to, to have that foundation built. And so uh, by 2010 is when it really kind of started to become its own uh, cult phenomenon in the vein of, of Rocky Horror. Yeah, because, I mean, it was, I just couldn't believe it. When I went um, the first time, it was like at the Sunset Five, and a friend said, You gotta go, you gotta go. And so I went, and it was like all five theaters were sold out. The line was wrapped like on two levels of that mall, I think. It was like Star Wars. Yeah, or something yeah. Opening day. yeah that, that, was, uh, that was in 2009. In fact, one of the very first interviews I did, I think it was September of 2009, uh, you interviewed me. For uh, the South Pasadena Weekly. Oh, Pasadena, yeah. Uh, that was like September of 2009, and that's when it was really starting to, uh, to to screen like that, where it was screening once a month and on all five screens. And um, But, uh, yeah, no, that was one of the very first interviews I did was with you for <laughs> South Pasadena Weekly. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so then um, do you guys have any idea, has he ever said, uh, I imagine because it wound up playing in like 27 cities around the world every week at midnight, correct? So it, it, it's made back the $6 million, I would assume, right? 
Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I think that it's definitely um, – people are definitely – seeing it around the world and it's now playing in, in Hong Kong and um, you know it's all over the UK Wow! Yeah, so it's really uh, surprisingly people internationally have responded to it how do you feel about Dave Franco <laughs> let's talk about Dave's uh, portrayal really, of you yeah I really like Dave I thought he did a great job um, the dynamic between him and James worked really well mm-hmm um, I think that it's similar to Tommy and I in real life, um, and uh, you know, obviously the them being brothers, I think worked worked uh, beautifully. So uh, Dave was uh, very kind, and I think had a had a good grasp on what it's like to try to be a young actor making in Hollywood and kind of trying to keep that hope alive. Uh, so yeah, no, I thought Dave was, was great. Was awesome. Do you have any parts of like of the movie The Disaster Artist? that you could see through like an audience perspective that was like, eh, I don't know if reality was really quite like that, or we might've romanticized that part a little bit. Um, I think everything was pretty much done, uh, in spirit of the book and the story. You know, I think it was not an easy film to make. Um, you know, the book, uh, was pretty complex and a lot of stories. And so I thought they were smart in the way they adapted it mm-hmm. and, and made the friendship chapters, uh, the first half of the film, so you invest in, you know, in these two guys. Um, but no, I, when I, I really enjoyed the film, and I thought, uh, you know, I, it, I didn't ever think like, oh, I wish they did this or that. I just, I enjoyed it for what it was. Yeah. Well, well, one thing I was wondering is, um, like, why did it take so long to try and do another uh, movie uh, when you guys have had this phenomenon since at least two thousand nine or ten? Uh, was there any reason to just get the idea finally a year or two ago, or uh, were there other attempts? Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I didn't expect to to make another film with Tommy. Uh, to be totally honest, I was never on my radar. But uh, I did see a rough cut of the disaster a couple years ago, and I, I don't know. I just something about the idea of trying to make something good this time around, and with me, you know, in charge of it for so long. Tommy always tried to pushed me to make my own film and kind of work with him in that way. And I never really wanted to. And then when I finally got the idea, I'd been working on a bunch of TV show ideas and I thought, okay, I've, you know, I, the disaster was a great experience writing. And I thought, why not go back and, and try to create a film uh, for he and I, and there's so many experiences we've had together to draw from because both films are based, inspired by true events. So um, again, it was just, it's a crazy undertaking. I think, Working with Tommy is very a very unique experience that it just uh, it wasn't something I was ready to do until recently. Well, you were saying this is rooted in true experience. Um, I mean the room, <laughs> the room, and um, best friends because best friends, from what the description is, is something to do uh, like sort of a black comedy with um, uh, mortician and, and death. I'm not really sure the whole plot. And then the room, um, you know, like is Tommy's life really that crazy? Crazy. Had, uh, uh, were, and were you involved in any of those kinds of shenanigans around him? Uh, for the room? Yeah. I know. I, you said it was inspired by real life and, and his life, and oh. so I don't know uh, exactly what those came from. I'm sure there was a Lisa. I'm sure. I'm not sure if you ever worked at a bank uh, or how that went down. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I think Tommy pulled a lot from not only our friendship, but I'm sure experiences in his life previously. And. Uh, the hell of a life, I'll tell you that. I think it's, people are still watching it 15 years later. <laughs> well, what about it with best friends? I mean, what's the real life aspect? Or can you describe the plot to people uh, just a little bit? It uh, so it's based on a road trip that Tommy and I took uh, back in 2003, in which uh, he thought it was plotting things against him for whatever reason, and uh, so yeah, it was inspired by that road trip. It's inspired by. Uh, a true uh, story about dentistry, about the under underground business of selling dental scrap, which is what these characters get into. So Tommy, you know, plays a mortician uh, who befriends this drifter, who's played by me. Uh, they develop this uh, a quirky friendship and discover they're they're sitting on a uh, a fortune of uh, very odd business, and they end up making good money, and problems start to happen. So. It's kind of, you know, the loose inspirations were like Nightcrawler, Drive, Dublin Infinity, kind of those great L.A. horror films. Um, 
and again, kind of capturing a mood in LA that we've never, uh, we haven't really seen on screen. Um, and so it's, uh, it's as strange as you would expect, I think. So, um, I was also wondering, one of the things that fascinated me was that the last uh, two or three months, I've been trying to get you as an interview, and you've been incredibly busy, obviously. So what I'm wondering is, can you tell us about like that wild ride of being around award season and getting to go to the Golden Globes when... You know, with uh, when you guys like like I said before, not to uh, you know uh, hammer at home too much, but you know for a long time there's no people. You guys were sort of treated like like either oddballs or pariahs, and then suddenly you're in the same room with Meryl Streep. Yeah, it was not something I uh, I ever expected, um, but you know it was it was incredibly rewarding to. Uh, you know, finally have created something that made it there. I know, um, you know, it was great to be involved with uh, James Franco, delivered just such a great performance uh, as Tommy. Um, yeah, it's one of those things you just kind of never know how you're going to feel when you get there. But, you know, being at the Golden Globes and, and even better, having the, the film win an award, yeah. uh, the Oscar nomination, all that stuff is just, it's, it's very rewarding and it just goes to show that, in, you know, in life, anything possible to, um, you know, never stop creating. Cause I mean, I think you, you know, one day you can make something that's considered terrible and the next idea might be great. And so, uh, just never get too high, never get too low. And, uh, you know, just something I'm hoping to, uh, to build on and continue to, to make stuff. Did you get to go to the Oscars? Uh, we didn't go to the Oscars, but, uh, but it was nominated for best adapted screenplay. Right. Uh, we went to got to go to, to some great parties, so I heard that's even uh, even better. But it was, it was of, uh, the whole award season was was really uh, was really cool. It was kind of surreal seeing Tommy interact with Hollywood A listers and see him do his thing. Yeah, you know they uh, they loved the disaster artist and they were I think intrigued by the whole thing. And, it is intriguing. Uh, <laughs> You know, just they, I think probably they know how hard it is to get a film made and to know somebody went out there and right. made it and tried to, like, keep it alive for 15 years. And uh, I think that in some ways, you know, they admire that, even if it's not exactly the traditional success <laughs> you shoot for. But um, I think they finally just kind of accepted the whole thing and thought, hey, you know, the room is still here. And at some point, you got to you got to look at it as a success. It just is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Has uh, success changed Tommy at all that you've noticed? Um, I don't. I mean, Tommy's Tommy. I think yeah. it's going to be hard to, to alter that. It but comes across as pretty think, authentic. Uh, I think he's just going to be uh, unique. And uh, to what varying degrees this, uh, this affects that, I guess, will remain to be seen. <laughs> So um, th- did you find that either the attention from the room once it became really popular or did it help or hurt your ability to get auditions or other roles or did the little odd career? Because uh, I know Tommy went around the world regularly to all these screenings. So it's become like a, from what I understand, it's like a jet setting lifestyle where he's able to go and stoke the fire of the fans by showing up in each of these cities a couple times a year. And so how often did you travel a lot with them also? And did that become like a career or, uh, or have you kept acting all along and did it affect it? Um, yeah, I started traveling with Tommy when I was working on the book, especially cause I would interview him and, you know, I, uh, being around, it was very helpful because I wanted every line in the disaster artist to be a line he said. Uh, at some point or, or did say. So that was very helpful. Um, and then uh, it's just one of those things. I mean, the room is, is a phenomenon, but it's not it's not something that's going to, uh, you're going to show producers and say, hire me based on this film. So you really <laughs> got to kind of go out and prove yourself. Um, Although I think and, that the marketing is something you could definitely point to. Sure. Yeah, the book was a great chance to kind of tell people who you are and where, what your journey has been. Um, but I think with, with making best friends, I think we live in a time now where you can really go out and make your own films, uh, and give yourself your own opportunity, which, you know, you're going to know what roles you fit best. You don't really need to sit back and, 
you know, plays 